All right, on to chapter 17. Um, I'm going to do a couple of PowerPoints uh, for this topic. Uh, this topic is the control of gene expression. Um, actually, the title on this is wrong, I just noticed. Um, so, glad I, glad I noticed that. I mean, it's, we go through a lot of effort to distinguish between uh, gene expression and bacteria and eukaryotes. This chapter is about eukaryotes. Okay, so not bacteria. We already did bacteria. Chapter 17 is control of gene expression in eukaryotes. All right, but now we just did um, gene expression in bacteria, and the things that we came up with are this idea that there are cis-acting sequences. And like a transcription start site. And then we have a gene that's being transcribed. Um, for example, there might be a promoter. Um, and then there might be other sequences. So we've got cis-acting sequences and then the proteins that bind those sequences. So the lac operon and all that was showing how we originally figured out that there were cis-acting sequences and transacting factors. And these proteins are called transacting factors. So that's a starting point for, uh, we figured that out in bacteria, that there are cis-acting sequences, transacting factors. And so that's sort of the starting point for looking at eukaryotic um, transcription control. And there are just numerous cis-acting sequences and numerous different proteins that bind on to these things and regulate transcription. Uh, so that's really what this whole chapter is about. Uh, we'll go into some um, uh, s some experiments that show that showed this, um, and then another thing that's going to be really important for uh, eukaryotic uh, gene regulation is so again we're talking about eukaryotic gene regulation. And we know now that eukaryotic um, DNA in chromosomes is wrapped up into chromatin. So here's the 30 nanometer uh, fiber. And we're going to consider this what we call condensed chromatin. And sort of the extreme version of condensed chromatin would be heterochromatin. And the idea is that genes are off. And they're not transcribed uh, when the chromatin is condensed. But then we can loosen that chromatin up and then gain access to some of these cis-acting sequences. And then these proteins can get in there and bind um, onto these sequences. But those proteins can't bind. They can't get in to bind onto those cis-acting sequences when there's... Uh, when the chromatin is all scrunched up into this higher, high, more highly condensed fiber. So there's DNA wrapped around in here. If we can get it. So there's DNA in there, but the DNA is not accessible to these proteins. So that's sort of the three main things that we're going to be talking about. We're going to be talking about chromatin structure and changes in chromatin structure. And then what kinds of cis-acting sequences are there? And how do we find those and how do we define those? And what kinds of transacting uh, factors are there or proteins? And sort of generally speaking, these things are called transcription factors, which makes sense because these are proteins or factors that affect transcription. So that's the gist of this chapter. And we'll go over uh, this little PowerPoint's only got 20 or so slides, so it shouldn't take too long. And then we will um, take a look at uh, another thing that I call a supplemental gene regulation PowerPoint that covers a lot. And it, it focuses more on some of the techniques. <coughs> All right, so this is just sort of talking a little bit about what I just said. So eukaryotic cells um, 
have a lot of the things in common in terms of cis-acting sequences, transacting factors, and there's like gene activation and there's, and there's gene repression as well. Um, and uh, there's a couple things that are different. And, you know, we've covered this already a little bit. Um, so one thing that we'll talk about is that each each gene in eukaryotes has its own promoter. So there will not be operons the way there were in bacteria. DNA must, um, the histones must loosen up so that the DNA is accessible to be bound by different proteins. And transcription and translation are separated. Um, transcription happens in the nucleus and translation happens in cytoplasm. So that's different in eukaryotic cells. So these are things that are true of eukaryotes. Um, so let me just emphasize a couple of those things. Uh, so one thing that's critical is that in eukaryotes, so we talked about operons in um, bacteria, uh, but now if we think about eukaryotic cells, and we're just let's just think about the nucleus right now. So this is going to be the we're going to be looking at the nucleus. And let's say this is a liver cell. And then this is a different cell. This is a kidney cell. So the main thing, all cells in a particular organism have the same genes. But they are expressed differently. Now don't forget that. That is the key. When the difference between a kidney cell and a liver cell isn't because the kidney cell has kidney specific genes and the liver cell has liver specific genes. It's because the kidney cell expresses kidney specific genes and the liver cell expresses um, liver specific genes. So let's just say we've got um, some chromosomes and we'll just put a couple of them in there. So same chromosomes in both cells, same genes in both cells. So let's say there's a gene here, and that's a little sequence that goes with that gene. Maybe there's a sequence that goes with that gene. And there's another gene. And let's say that the green genes are expressed in, um, in the liver. and that the red genes are expressed, so this is RNA transcripts coming from those genes in the kidney, but the green genes are not. So these genes are there, but they're not expressed. So what, so what that means is that there's some transcription factor that's present in the liver cell that binds onto this sequence in the liver specific genes, and there's some other protein that's present in the kidney cell that binds on to those genes and expresses those. So these are what we call, this would be a, a liver specific transcription factor. And this might be a liver specific promoter or enhancer. And this would be a kidney specific promoter. And then this would be a kidney transcription factor. Now, of course, this is oversimplified, but that's the idea. And the other thing that's clear here is that, so the genes, so so you might, these liver-specific genes, they're not organized into a liver-specific operon. It's not that both of these genes are controlled by the same promoter and the same other cis-acting sequences. So going back, this is this point here, is that, each gene has its own promoter and is transcribed separately and that different genes have different promoters that tell them when and where they're supposed to be expressed. This we already talked about a little bit so that's just uh, this picture where we have condensed chromatin and the genes are off and we have loose chromatin so this is more decondensed or looser chromatin and the genes are on. So this, from here, this gene would be expressed.
So pretty simple ideas. And then transcription and translation are separated between time and space. Let's throw in another slide for that. Um, and what that, the significance of that in terms of this topic of gene regulation, let's make a big old cell here, and we'll make a nucleus. And we'll have just a gene in there of some kind. That gene gets transcribed. Then this RNA goes out to the nucleus, or out of the nucleus, and, and maybe if this is eukaryotes, we might get some splicing. And then out here we'd have our gene that's spliced together, and then the ribosome hops along, binds on there, and translates the gene, goes down to a stop codon, makes a protein, this protein folds up. Then this protein might have to go somewhere. It might have to go to the nucleus. It might go to the mitochondria. It might go out. Of, it might be secreted out, out of the cell. It might go into the cell membrane. And so there's a lots of different points um, along this pathway where, where the gene's expression can be regulated. So the expression only counts when you actually get to the final um, the final function and the final function requires that the gene be transcribed it be is spliced in a particular way it's translated it's folded in a proper way uh, there might be some post translational modifications that are added to this protein that help it get to where it's going or help it do what it's doing so different things might get added to it and all of that is are different opportunities for gene regulation so lots of lots of opportunities for gene regulation so we're going to talk mainly about transcriptional regulation but we'll talk about a couple of other things too um, but you know the first place we'll start is transcriptional regulation so gene regulation turning genes on turning genes off at the transcriptional level or you can have so you can have um, you know, transcriptional regulation. Post-transcriptional. For example, RNA splicing. You can splice things in different ways and get different functions out of the protein. Um, RNA stability, if you, you know, the poly A tail might be different in different RNAs. Um, translational regulation. Um, Post-translational regulation. So translational regulation would just be maybe some RNAs get translated better than others. They have better R ribosome binding sites, and so they just get translated more efficiently. Post-translational might be... Um, um, different post-translational modifications of the protein like phosphorylation, glycosylation, and others. There's lots of different potential uh, post-translational modifications that regulate the activity of the protein. And again, re regulating always means like turning on, turning off. Uh, but they can always also mean like turning up and turning down. So, you, so it's not an all or nothing thing necessarily. Um, so let's talk about um, regulating gene expression starting at the beginning. So starting at making the chromatin more accessible to um, transcription factors. Uh, so, so we need to talk about uh, Chromatin, um, so DNA, so how do we know that the chromatin is loose? And we do an experiment called a DNA hypersensitivity experiment, and we identify DNA hypersensitivity sites, and those sites then um, usually correlate with higher levels of gene expression. And then we can talk a little bit about um, different types of histone modification that lead to changes in chromatin structure. A um, couple examples 
methyl groups and acetyl groups are added to the histone tails. So if we think about, we got the, the nucleosome with these histones, and some of these histones had these tails sticking off, and we can add different groups to those tails. And that can change the structure of chromatin. And so we're going to want to talk about some of the experiments that we can do to do that. All right, so DNA sensitivity is, is a type of experiment that tells you the state of the chromatin. So if you have chromatin that is loose, or I'm sorry, this is tight, and we got our DNA is associated with that, and maybe we've got some chromatin over here that's loose, and this might be a different region of DNA, and so you've got some DNA that's associated with that, we can ask the question, is the DNA associated with tight chromatin or loose chromatin? So this is, or, or condensed, or decondensed. The way we do that is a DNA sensitivity experiment. And DNA is an enzyme that cuts DNA. So you take this enzyme and you add it to, and this is two separate experiments. You take this DNA, this DNA, and you add it, and if it has the opportunity, it will chew that DNA up. But here, it can't get to that DNA. It can't get to it and chew it up. So if you isolate chromatin, add DNA, and then isolate DNA, and then somehow detect whether this DNA is present, this DNA is still present. That DNA is still there because it was protected from being chewed up by DNA. You do the same experiment with loose chromatin, and this DNA can get in there and chew up this DNA, and it actually cuts it up into pieces. So then you isolate DNA, and then you detect this specific sequence, detect the specific DNA you're interested in, and this DNA is gone. It's been chewed up. It's so this is gone. It's just chewed up into little pieces. And so if you were to run that on a gel or something, you wouldn't be able to see it. Now, there are various ways to detect the sequence. You can do a southern blot. That helps you detect sequences. You can do PCR. That helps you detect specific sequences. Or you can do DNA sequencing. And that helps you uh, do those things. All right. So we're gonna, we will talk about some <clears throat> experiments where we do all three of those things or one or the other. Um, but this is the general idea. And so this one, because it's sensitive to DNA, it's DNA sensitive. And so that, that this region of DNA would be called a DNA hypersensitive site because it's more sensitive to DNA than the other stuff. So this is showing how uh, there's a couple different ways that you can loosen up and tighten up um, chromatin and so this is showing even though it's not as tight as I was showing it before we're talking about sort of this region of DNA is is positioned inside the nucleosome and there's a process called chromatin remodeling where you actually move the nucleosome to the side and you and you free up DNA that's that was part of this nucleosome so that's one mechanism for loosening up DNA so that it can be transcribed. So it's called it's called remodeling. So chromatin remodeling, um, it's an active process that actually moves the, it sort of unwinds the DNA out of the, out of the histone. And then you can get different transcription factors can bind and RNA polymerase can bind and that sort of thing. And again, if we, if we, if we did an experiment and we, and we could tell the difference between this, this would down here, this would this region would now be sensitive to DNA. So maybe we did something that we added some chemical or something that caused uh, the chromatin to go from condensed to decondensed.
and then that would show up as a as a DNA's hypersensitive site. So it's hyper means more, so it's more sensitive than the other thing. Another common way to go from condensed chromatin to decondensed chromatin is through the through the addition of um, acetyl groups to histone tails. This is a little bit weird the way they're showing this, but what they're trying to show is that here the histone is sort of grabbing onto the DNA. And the idea is that there's these these histone tails have lysine on them. And if you think about, even though we didn't memorize all the amino acids, if you looked it up, uh, lysine is a, is a K for its single letter code and plus for uh, it's actually a positively charged amino acid. Now the way I wrote that, it looks like potassium because potassium is K plus ion, but it's not that. It's just it's just a lysine that's positively charged. Right, so it's it's got a positive charge. Well, this positive charge can interact with the DNA, which is um, we'll give it as green, which is negatively charged. So so the positive charge of lysine can interact with the negative charge of DNA. Here we've taken that positive charge and added an acetyl group and an acetyl group is just a short it's like that's acetic acid and we're just adding a two carbon um, molecule to uh, to this amino acid and now it's neutral so the acetyl group is neutral. And so that causes these tails to let go of the DNA and loosen up a little bit. That's the idea. I don't know about this. It's kind of a goofy looking picture, but that's what they're trying to show. Um, so there's various ways to change chromatin structure. One is chromatin remodeling, which is just some enzymes get in there and... Um, I'm trying to move this thing back where it was. No, it doesn't really matter. So chromatin remodeling, I showed, showed you that. That's where some enzymes actually move the the chromatin out of the way. Um, histone acetylation, which I just showed you, is another way to change uh, chromatin structure. And another thing that's often correlated with chromatin structure changes is DNA methylation. And there are these things, and this usually is found uh, near genes. They're called CPG islands and it's really just a bunch of CGs in a row. I don't know why they call them CPG islands but that's just the phosphate that's in between. But you could just call them CG islands. And these C's can get methylated. And the methylation of these C's often causes chromatin condensation or chromatin, chromatin, chromatin scrunching up, for, for back of a, lack of a better word. So we can have, um, so there's various ways that we can change chromatin structure. So we can start out tight, and then we can have chromatin remodeling. and then that will loosen up chromatin. We can have, we could start out with tight chromatin. We can add an acetyl group and that loosens it up. So now if we have acetyl groups added to each, we added to some of these lysines and that loosens it up. We can have deacetylation. We can take those lysines back off deacetylation and then that's going to go back this way and it's going to tighten it up. We can also have chromatin methylation or, or histone methylation and that's different than the DNA methylation I just mentioned but histone methylation so you can write ME for a methyl group that correlates with tight chromatin usually 
And so we can have methylation makes it tighten up. And this is histone methylation. And demethylation loosens it up. But we could also have DNA methylation. So DNA methylation, you got your DNA sequence near a gene. This is in the context of relatively loose chromatin. If we add methyl groups to the DNA now, not to the histones, that often causes the DNA in that region to tighten up. So DNA methylation, as well as histone methylation, can shut down gene expression. All right, so let's summarize that one more. We got, we got chromatin remodeling, acetylation and deacetylation, histone methylation and demethylation, and then also throw over here DNA methylation is another mechanism for changing chromatin structure. All right, so all of these things can affect gene expression. This is a picture of a type of experiment that allows you to ask questions about um, the state of chromatin. And in particular, in this case, we're going to look for um, specific modifications of chromatin or you can you can really ask a lot of different questions and this is called chromatin immuno precipitation so this is chip chromatin immuno precipitation this is a chip experiment and so here we have a cell this cross-linking, that's just, we have some DNA proteins that are bound to the DNA. You can experimentally add chemical cross-links to make that binding more permanent so that they stay bound um, when you lice the cell open and everything. So you're sort of trapping the proteins there. Um, you, then you release chromatin. It's important that you release chromatin and not DNA. And then you break it up into smaller pieces add antibodies, this little Y-shaped thing is an antibody. That antibody, will, you could make that antibody specific to anything you want. And so just without worrying about how you do it, you can make an antibody specific to <coughs> specific histones, to specific acetylated histones, to specific transcription factors, whatever you want. And then you precipitate down uh, the chromatin that with that antibody, so we're, when we say precipitate, we mean we're going to spin it down into the bottom of a tube. And then we're going to ask a question of, well, what came down to the bottom of the tube? The only stuff that came to the bottom of the tube is stuff that was recognized by a particular antibody. So that's what antibodies look like, sort of. And so this antibody brought this stuff to the bottom of the tube. And then we can say, well, what DNA is there? And we're going to show some more examples of this. And there's several different ways that you can tell what DNA is present. Um, but these days, what we would do is DNA sequencing. And so that would be called a chip seek experiment, where you, where you do chromatin immunoprecipitation and then sequence the DNA that comes down. And you can do that you, these days with the types of new DNA sequencing methodology that's available is you can get thousands and millions of, of sequences and you can say let's say that we're interested up here we've got an antibody against acetylated histone so acetylated hist a particular histone has an acetyl group um, connected to it and we can have an antibody that so and this is AB stands for antibody um, antibody against that and, and, tell, and then you can say, you know, tell me all sequences associated with um, 
acetylated histone. And you could do that for anything. But here we're doing acetylated histone because that's the antibody that we brought it down. You could say, tell me all the sequences that are associated with methylated histone. You could say, tell me all the DNA in the cell that's associated with just regular histone that's not acetylated. Um, so that's a chip seek, and we're going to talk about that a lot. So look that up, figure it out, make sure you understand it. Okay, so um, we're building up to kind of an overall picture. And I think my other um, PowerPoint does a little better job of this. Um, so I want you to watch both of these. Um, but the idea is how are genes regulated? And the idea is that the genes are tight, then they loosen up. When they loosen up, then there's cis-acting sequences that become available for proteins to bind. And so far we've talked a little bit about this process, about how you go about loosening up chromatin structure. But now we want to talk about um, these cis-acting sequences. What kinds are there? How do we find them? and these transacting factors. What, what kinds of transacting factors there are. And it turns out that if you look at a gene, I'm going to put the start site way down here. Um, so we have a promoter. And there are certain, um, and sometimes the promoter overlaps the initiation site. And there are specific types of transcription factors that bind here. And you may recall that there's the Tata -ta binding protein. In here there's the Tata -ta box. And then the protein that binds the Tata -ta box is the Tata -ta binding protein. But there's a lot of other things that bind here. Lots of different colors. Maybe some different shapes. There's this big complex of proteins that binds there. The proteins that bind here, so, so the DNA sequence is called the promoter, and then the proteins that bind here are called general transcription factors. General is also sometimes called basal. And when we're talking about transcription of using RNA polymerase 2, then these are transcription factors associated with RNA polymerase 2, and they're called TF2, A, B, C, D, etc. And we don't need to get into all of them. But TF2D is the one that contains the Tata binding protein. So that's this. That's part of TF2D. Then you have other sequences that are far away. And some of these might be enhancers. Some of these might be silencers. Now these are examples of cis-acting sequences. And then the proteins that bind them, these proteins would be called repressors. These proteins would be called activators. And together, these things are regulatory transcription factors. So we've got basal or general transcription factors, and then regulatory transcription factors. The idea that all genes need to be bound by TF2A, TF2B, TF2D, and then genes ha every gene has a different combination of enhancers and silencers that tell that gene when to be expressed. <coughs> um, now, th the way this works is... We've got all of these sequences. We've got our transcription start site. We've got a promoter. We've got, let's just talk about enhancers at this point. The enhancers, their job is to help 
all those um, so they get bound by activators and those activators function by helping the general transcription factors bind to the promoter and the way they do that is these activator proteins bind with other proteins called I need more colors Ooh, purple we have the other proteins there's a whole bunch of proteins in here and then they interact so it's a big huge protein conglomeration of all these different proteins and yes and then that will help these general transcription factors assemble at the promoter and eventually RNA polymerase comes along and transcribes the gene. So this is a very common type of drawing to represent what's happening at transcription initiation where these activators interact with this thing in the middle that help these general transcription factors uh, bind the promoter which help RNA polymerase bind the promoter which starts transcription. These guys are the activators. These guys in here are the basal transcription factors. This thing this big thing is called called the mediator. And the individual proteins that make up the mediator are called co-activators. So they help these activators activate transcription. So transcriptional activators and co-activators stimulate transcription. And they do that by um, helping these basal transcription factors bind at the promoter. And then the mediator is the thing in the middle that sort of ties these two things together and I usually call that the mediator that's what everybody else calls it I call it the mega blob because it's this big huge conglomeration of proteins uh, the book goes into a, an example of Gale 4 and how it regulates uh, galactose genes um, I don't think we're going to go into that uh, specifically so this is the diagram I was just trying to show so you've got your core promoter, which is the, the promoter that's near the transcription start site. It includes the TATA box and maybe even a little bit of the initiation site. Um, then you have these other binding sites. And I'm, these would be farther away probably. Uh, sometimes you can have these proteins. Uh, well, I guess this is at the top it's showing all these different promoters. So you can have a core promoter. You can have some activator proteins that bind nearby. Um, but then you can also have enhancers that are farther away. These activator proteins bind the enhancers. They interact with the mediator, which contains co-activators. They interact with the basal transcription apparatus. For That's all these little guys. And then this big sort of beige thing is RNA polymerase, and then it transcribes the gene. All right, so that's transcription initiation and how it's regulated. These are just examples of some promoters. <coughs> um, just examples that there are different kinds of sequences that, that are upstream of these promoters. Um, not all promoters have a TATA -ta box, but many of them do. The TATA -ta box is typically about 20 base pairs, 15 to 20 base pairs upstream of the transcription start site. And then these are just other examples of types of cis-acting sequences that you would see um, upstream of various genes. And they're all different. That's that's the point, is that you have a different combination of transcription sequences that control transcription, cis-acting sequences. And by cis-acting sequences, we just mean that proteins bind onto here, and then they regulate transcription of that gene. But they don't regulate um, the cis-acting sequences, um, don't regulate other genes that they're not connected to. So just like the promoter and the operator of E. coli. There are other trans, so the different types of um, the transcription factors involved. We have in eukaryotes, we have repressors that bind to silencers. Uh, 
We have enhancers that bind to, well, enhancers are the DNA sequence, and then activators are the proteins that bind them. And then there are these other things called insulators that sort of block the function of an enhancer. So if you have an enhancer here, so by itself an enhancer could act anywhere. Uh, enhancers, you can put them anywhere and they can act over long distances. Um, so if you had an enhancer here, it could activate that gene and it could activate that gene. And sometimes that happens. Um, but you can put in a, or some, this is supposed to be a stop sign. There are these things called insulators that, that block the effect of an enhancer. So if you have an enhancer, but you only want it to affect this gene, sometimes there'll be an insulator that blocks its effect on the adjacent gene. So that's what this is showing. You've got your, you've got a couple of different enhancers. Uh, we want this enhancer to be specific for this gene, and we want this enhancer to be specific for this gene. So there's this insulator that sort of sets up a boundary between between those two genes. That's all that is. This is showing um, another gene that this particular gene called the metallothionine gene. And that's a gene that can get turned on by lots of different signals. And so the DNA sequence upstream of this gene allows this gene to respond to different signals. Um, for example, this the simple example is there's a GRE, <coughs> which is a DNA sequence that responds to steroid hormones. <coughs> And so the, and G in this case, another word for steroid is glucocorticoid. So this is a glucocorticoid response element. Um, you could have other things. You can have estrogen response elements, testosterone response elements. So these are elements that respond to signals from outside the cell that tell this gene to be expressed and there'll be a specific protein that binds onto that response element and this particular gene has a lot of different response elements that um, tell it to be expressed under certain circumstances you of course don't have to memorize all these different elements <coughs> they're just uh, examples of some um, different types of response elements uh, we got a heat shock element this is a dna sequence that if it's upstream of a gene that gene will uh, get turned on in response to a heat shock where you change the temperature sort of you raise the temperature quickly and a bunch of genes get turned on the glucocorticoid response element uh, that's like a steroid response element just means you add a you add a um, steroid and that turns the gene on four ball ester is a particular type of hormone <coughs> um, serum response element so that's for genes so serum if you take cells in culture and you add serum, those cells start to divide. And so there's a sig signal transduction mechanism, something in serum, so there's some kind of serum growth factor, and it binds onto a receptor, and that eventually leads to specific genes being bound by particular proteins and turning that gene on. So this would be a serum response element. And then this would be some serum transcription factor that turns on the gene. All right, so that's just kind of a quick overview of transcriptional control of gene expression in eukaryotes. The key points are chromatin structure gets changed by several mechanisms. Cis-acting sequences are present. They get bound by various proteins. Um, those proteins interact with the mediator, which interacts with the basal transcription apparatus, which then causes the gene to be turned on. We're going to go over another PowerPoint that goes into that in much more detail. Uh, but we also want to talk about regulation through other mechanisms, in this case, uh, through RNA splicing. Uh, we're just going to talk about 
one example, and we're going to kind of do a simplified version of this. As you'll see in a minute, this stuff, particularly with the figures they show you, uh, really looks complicated. Um, so let's just take a look at that one. So this is showing that, uh, you know, we know that in flies, if you have an XX fly, it develops as a female. Well, there's a lot of stuff that happens in between there. And if you have an XY fly, it develops as a male. Well, it turns out that there's a whole series of genes that have to be expressed in a particular way in order for a fly to develop as either a male or a female. So if you have an XX genotype, it turns on this gene called sex lethal. Um, so that's what XSL stands for. It makes a protein. That protein regulates the splicing of the of the of the this gene called TRA. So transformer, TRA, transformer. So that's the one we're going to talk about. Then this TRA pre-RNA pre gets spliced in a particular way to form a functional TRA protein, which interacts with this other protein called TRA2. They act together to splice this gene called double sex in a particular way and then you make the female version of that protein and you make a female fly. In males you don't make the sex lethal protein the tra pre RNA gets spliced in a different way. So this is what we're talking about is that there's a different type of splicing that occurs so that in females you get a functional tra protein um, but in males you don't get a functional tra protein. If you don't get a functional trap protein, then double sex gets spliced in a different way and you end up with a male. So we want to look at this. What, how is this tra pre-mRNA spliced differently um, in, in cells that are eventually going to lead to a female or a male? And so that, I think, is too complicated, so we're going to do it like this. So we have a transformer gene with a couple of exons. Um, now this um, can get spliced in a couple of uh, different ways. Now there's, there actually is a splice site here and here. And you can splice that to give you this. <clears throat> and if you splice it that way, you get a functional protein. However, there's also another splice site. Uh, that's upstream here. And so sometimes you can splice to that site. So sometimes you can splice here and sometimes you can splice here. And if you splice in the second way, you get a functional protein. If you splice in the first way, you don't get a functional protein. So let's look at the two different ways that that can happen. So we're going to look at this gene in males and females. So same gene. Same number of exons, same exact DNA sequence. And we're going to have it in females and males. Now in males, so what will happen in splicing is if there's a good splice site here, then the splicing apparatus will splice to that splice site. So let's put like another little, so that makes this like a little exon right here. And so in males, when it splices, it splices it so that it includes this little bit, this little red bit, and this blue stuff. And then it turns out in this area, there's a stop codon. So no functional protein. 
it's not a mutation. So, you know, it looks like maybe a nonsense mutation or something like that because now we've got a, a new stop code on there. But it's actually the wild type normal sequence, but in males it splices to that splice site. And because that splice site is first, it never makes it to the second splice site. Now, in females, this little extra splice site here gets bound by the protein called sex lethal. So sex lethal will bind onto that splice site. And that means that when the splice zone comes in and tries to splice it, it skips over that because it can't see that splice site. So now you get this RNA. And this makes a functional protein. So this is an example of gene regulation at the post-transcriptional level because you've got the same gene, same RNA, same um, but a different outcome in males and females. Okay, so if we thought of this as the, as the, the blue stuff is the DNA, well, so the gene would look like that and then this would be the pre-mRNA. And it it just gets spliced differently. So if we go back up to this picture, and maybe we can clear some of this stuff out. What we see is in females, the sex lethal protein is present. <clears throat> because sex lethal is present, it causes tra to be spliced at a downstream site. So that what that means is with sex lethal present, it's blocking this area and it's causing it to be sliced like that. But in males, we've got this other splice site that will splice here and it'll bring in additional sequences after splicing. So this will give us this. And this one will give us this. And so this gives us functional protein. And then this gives us no functional protein because it stops too early. And then the function of that protein try, actually it goes on to regulate the splicing of another gene downstream and cause it to, causes it to be expressed in a female specific way. Um, if you don't have the functional protein, then that double sex protein gets spliced in a different way. Um, and so there's a whole cat, they call it a splicing, alternative splicing cascade that um, leads to these different phenotypes based on splicing. And so this is a really good example of what we call alternative splicing. Same gene, same DNA, same pre-mRNA but spliced differently under different circumstances to give a very different result. We get a female here, we get a male here. So it's pretty cool. So it's a very obvious um, sort of switch or, or regulatory step or regulatory decision that happens. Now I have to say that, uh, let me, I got to give a little plug for my PhD advisor. Um, he was one of the main guys who used to study this back in like the 80s. Um, and his name is, I should get a picture of him. His name's John Belote, one of the smartest guys and nicest guys I've ever met. And he's one of the main guys that helped figure out this splicing system. Yeah, I'll draw a picture of him. He's always got these little glasses. So he's smiling. He's got a little beard. <laughs> so that's John Below. We'll get a picture of him. All right. So this is the same thing. So here it's showing. Um, it's showing a little too much because it's showing the second exon here that or intron that's not affected. Um, but here it's just showing that that here in a male, it's going to splice to that first exon, and then in the female, it's going to skip that and go to the next one. And so, so this 
male has this extra stop code on in the middle, and the female has this continuous open reading frame. So she gets a functional protein. So it's a very good example of alternative splicing. Then the rest of this chapter in your book talks about RNA interference. Uh, we talked about that in chapter 14 as well. Um, and so we don't need to go over this in, in too much more detail, but this is just putting it in the context of gene regulation. So uh, it's just another way to regulate uh, DNA or, or regulate gene expression. And so in all of these cases, you start with um, a double-stranded RNA, double-stranded RNA, and it gets can get processed into short interfering RNAs. These can bind onto a messenger RNA, cause it to be chopped up into smaller bits. You can have, um, and usually these, in the case of SI RNAs, this this RNA is what we call exogenous RNA, meaning it gets either injected by a scientist to turn off a particular gene, um, or it um, maybe it comes in as part of a virus and needs to be destroyed. Um, these microRNAs are often endogenous, <coughs> meaning they're normal genes whose job it is is to regulate other genes. And so they sometimes get expressed. They still have a double-stranded region of DNA, but often it's part of this hairpin loop. They get processed into smaller single-stranded RNAs. They bind onto target messenger RNAs. This little loop right here is showing that they don't match 100%. And these guys inhibit translation. So if you've got your mRNA with this and... Even, even though it's down in the 3' prime UTR, it somehow regulates translation and doesn't let the ribosome translate. Um, <laughs> another thing we didn't talk about before is that double-stranded RNA can also... Oops. Uh, double-stranded RNA can also regulate gene expression by causing DNA methylation, which then leads to altered chromatin structure and turns genes off. So all of these things are mechanisms for turning genes off. So we've talked about that before, so I won't belabor the point. Um, this is just saying the same thing we just talked about. All right, so that's chapter 17. <clears throat> and then we'll do my supplemental gene regulation PowerPoint that goes into a little bit more about the experiments for how we figure this stuff out.